VIP access. VIP access with Aniko and Africa Loud. Welcome to a brand new season of VIP Access. I'm really excited to be bringing you another fresh, lit, and cool series and VIP Access season that's going to feature amazing artists from around Africa and beyond. The artist I'm about to interview today is Australian and Kenyan, and it's so amazing. I would actually call it serendipity because this specific season of VIP Access is brought to you in collaboration with the Australia High Commission. Thank you so much to my good friends, our good friends at the Australia High Commission. So the artist I'm about to speak to brought us a wonderful EP called Nilotic in 2022. She's been busy working since then and almost ready to release her other album, or let me say her debut album. Ladies and gentlemen, this artist is an amazing singer, an amazing producer. She doubles between different genres from hip hop, jazz. So she's actually really dope at everything she does. Welcome, Elsie Wameo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Just those words, I'm sitting here like, what do I do with all these flowers? <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Oh my God, to what do we owe this pleasure? <sighs> No, it's my, it's honestly my honor. And it's, I'm the one that I'm like in awe. I'm like in awe to see you and to meet you. And I, I was saying, I, I love what you do. And I, I think I just, it's such a, it's such an amazing thing to like put artists and creators in the limelight. So I'm glad that I'm on, I'm on, on your, on your oh, page. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I think, I think um, I'm a fan of yours so much. And when I saw you, I was like, oh my God, I'm so starstruck. And you were like, <laughs> stop it. Yeah. But you know, I've been listening to you for a long time, you know, um, since Nailotti came out and, you know, for you to be at my podcast is really surreal. You are such a dope artist and, and, and I listen to you all the time. So you kind of dropped out of my Spotify, Apple music <laughs> into Kenya. Real life. Not to, ma- not to mention, <laughs> I'm, I'm plugging Apple music. Go, hey. go. To Africa now radio. <laughs> so so welcome to Thank Kenya you. and to VAP Access. How Thank are you? you? I'm great. This is my first podcast in Kenya. <laughs> so I feel like we're ticking a lot of boxes today. <laughs> I'm great. I'm so so great. That's amazing. How how is the 2024? Did you start Ooh. the year on a good note? Oh yes. I feel like it's fresh year, fresh new start, and I'm just really excited to share what I've been feeling and what I've been creating and yeah, just a new chapter. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So I always kind of give a little picture about the person I'm talking to on my podcast. I try to explain who they are. I think I already mentioned that Elsie Wameo is Kenyan Australian, uh, born in Nairobi, yes. raised in um, Australia, but you know, constantly in Nairobi to see her family as well. Yeah. But back in Australia, you're one of the leaders um, of young artists who are also pushing a revolution of the hip hop sound. Mm. Um, and I will say not just in Australia, but around the world, because even in Africa, you are among very few, you know, voices of women in the rap game. Mm. So I think I just want to know, like, how did you find yourself in the rap um, industry and how has it been so far for you navigating in the that industry mm. and different countries? I think, yeah, it's, it's a lot of challenges and I think the interesting thing was because I started as a singer, even me rapping was a surprise to me. So I remember <laughs> when I started, I was like, oh, okay. But I will say, I always tell people, I feel like I was a rapper before I was a singer because when I went to Australia, the first artists that I kind of came across were Nicki Minaj, Lil Wayne. So I was like the six, 10 year old listening to like hardcore hip hop. And I think subconsciously it always sat in in the back of my head and I always enjoyed just, especially with Nicki Minaj, her character, the way she could just like, I think she has like this alter ego called Roman. And I loved the way she could express herself in so many different ways. And so I think when I got to Nilotic, it was a place where I had so many emotions and so many different things that I wanted to say, but singing just couldn't translate that. And I think it's because... With singing, it's melodious, it's pretty. And I find sometimes you listen to a singer and you won't actually hear what they're saying, you just hear the melodies. And so I think I kind of just tapped into rapping because I found that was the best way that I could translate the anger and the frustration that I was feeling. Um, But now when I came out, honestly, I think it also took me by surprise because now obviously it's the headline saying, singer that's now a rapper and it's all this thing and I was, I'm sitting there like yeah okay cool now I'm kind of like in this in this game and that's the thing you look around and the, there's not many people that are doing that especially 
women, black women that are rapping in Australia. And I found that I kind of carried a cross that was heavier than I thought it was gonna be. But I've really been enjoying navigating it because with every challenge comes um, an opportunity to be able to grow and to teach and to learn. And so I think for me, it was as much as it is hard and it's it's a space that there are not many people that you can kind of look up to and, and learn from and it, um, and kind of, yeah, kind of just, I guess, use their blueprint in a way. Um, I looked at it in a way where I could use it as my opportunity then to create a blueprint for those who are coming up. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think when it comes to being the only one or the very few that are doing something, I, I think it comes with a lot of opportunities. And the beautiful thing about it is that you have a blank canvas and you can paint that picture and write that story however you want. So. I, yeah, I'm honestly honored to be one of the few that are doing it, but I know that there are many more that are coming. Mm. Yeah. Wow. I mean, when you speak, when I hear you, I always feel this conviction mm. and even confidence, and I really like it, like you exude that. Where do you think you get that? Because I think a lot of people sometimes, and mm. creatives or artists, sometimes, you know, shy of saying things about themselves. Yeah. And I just find that you are kind of comfortable to be yourself. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. Character building. You know, it, <laughs> <laughs> I think I've, I feel like even from just like family, so I've grown up with two brothers. I'm the only girl and I'm the youngest one. Girl, <laughs> girl. You had to, you I've, had to fight your way. <laughs> I've had to just, there are battles that I've had to fight. Of and course. I think even just, yeah, from family side of things, I think I've, I've grown up in a household that has really forced me to, be loud and to be firm and and to really show up and um kind of sit on top because brothers are not going to let you win and they're gonna when you lose they'll make sure you know that you lose so <laughs> for me i think naturally just from my upbringing i've always been that fighter and now i think outside of things um it kind of goes back to the fact that there are not many black female artists out there so when i was coming out as an artist i just honestly had a lot of support and I think looking back, it definitely helped me hearing those words every day, like, wow, like you're actually doing good. Keep pushing, keep going. You know, you can make something out of this. And I think just all those words subconsciously sat in my head. And I was like, yeah, do you know what? It's it's true. Like, I can do this. You know what I'm saying? So I think I was really surrounded by um, by great people that really that really saw something in me that I probably didn't even see in myself at that time. And I think with time, when you practice something, it becomes a habit. And now you just can't tell me nothing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now it's just, I just do the thing. You I know? love it. Yeah. I love it. That's so cool. Um, you spoke about growing up, you know, just kind of playing with your brothers, fighting with your brothers. Oh, so yeah. what, oh. what, what was growing up like? Did you, were you born in Nairobi? I mean, you, that's what I read from your yes. bio and your story. And just take me through, you know, your journey in life yeah. from the time you were born to the time you kind of relocated and found another home in Australia. Yeah, I, yeah so I was born in Nairobi and I stayed here up until, I think I was about six when I left. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I try to say to people that I was raised in Nairobi, but everyone denies it. But I feel like my values have come from Kenya and I'm going to hold on to that. So um, going into Australia, I was already a, a Kenyan little girl that... Mm ate ugali, ate chapati, we ate, like we were Kenyan full stop. And so I think the biggest um, kind of hurdle that I had when we moved was just the fact that I was different. And this is not anything to do with music, but just the general, like I look different, my hair's different. And then when you're a girl, I think it comes with so many other things. You want to look pretty, you want to look like everyone else. So whenever I used to go to school, um, I would always just like try to fit in and and wear makeup that did not suit my color, girl. There were just so many things that I would do just to try and like, you know, force myself into this puzzle that I was not meant to fit in. And I think with that, I think that's really where the character building comes from because mm. it was through that rough time that I really was like, okay, this isn't working. That's because that's not me. My hair is not supposed to look like that. I'm not supposed to eat like that. Because, you know, like you hear the stories, you're going to school, your mom's packed you like rice, nyama, like all these things. And your friends are just eating like sandwiches. And you're yeah. just there like, guys. And they're saying your food smells, this, 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 that. So 
I think it really is moments like that that sharpened who I was, but it was hard. It was really, really hard. And um, I think when you're such a young person as well, it it really does a lot to you. And I think a lot of those things I still live with today. Like I think, I, yeah, I definitely have a lot of, um, I, I want to call it trauma really. Um, and even just things that I've done to myself. And, and I, so now I've kind of like, um, it's so ingrained in a way, you know, and there are some things that I'm still trying to unlearn and tr still trying to grow in and still understand that you are just perfect just the way you are. Um, but yeah, so we, we moved to Australia, I was seven um, and I've lived there ever since. But like you said, I've been coming back to Kenya every like three, four years. We come and see family and everything. And that's been the biggest blessing because I think coming here always reminds me like, who I am, where I've come from, and that it's okay to be the way that I am. Um, and it's just been such a, it's such a beautiful thing to to bounce across two completely different environments. I think it comes with a lot of, um, with a lot of strengths and you learn so much, you know, um, but there are definitely the, the hardships of never feeling like you belong anywhere because in Australia, I'm black and they're white, so I don't fit in. And here I come and I have an accent, so I don't necessarily fit in either. So I think the hardest um, the hardest part of it till this day is just the fact that I've never really felt like I belong anywhere fully. Um, but I'm yeah, I think I'm still learning and I'm hoping that with time I kind of find my place in this world. Mm. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I mean, how then, do you fit in in even the music industry in Australia? Like when they hear your music and they see you or was it a case scenario where there are times when your music also just um, penetrates before they see you? And I know that you're touring quite a lot. Um, I think last summer you went across Europe yes. to other countries. You're touring with a very popular Australian band. <laughs> yes, sir. This girl is famous. <laughs> this is VAP access. <laughs> Those who know, no, no. Oh, so please, only with a new Tell us. Tell us. Yeah, I mean, I will say, I think music honestly was now my bridge between um, Kenya and Australia and painting that picture of who Elsie was. Because I think in this day and age, people just look at you and they go, okay, this is a black woman and that's it. And they never really want to know, what do you do? Who are you? Let, let do talk to me. So I think music for me was definitely that bridge. And yeah, um, I mean, in Australia, in the beginning, I want to say that I also still subconsciously was making music that kind of was palatable to Australia. Um, and not that I didn't enjoy the music, but I think for some time I was really trying to be intentional about making sure that, you know, the Australian audience and would still enjoy it. And that makes sense. That makes fair, sense. Right? <laughs> that's fair, right? That's very fair. Yeah. So I think... You have to cater to your audience. To your audience, You do right. have to, yeah. Exactly. And so I think that's what I was doing. And yeah, it, it was fine. I think with that came a lot of, you know, learning curves and I, I, I kind of kind of was fine tuning who I was in, as an artist. Um, and so, yeah, when I started, I, I want to say that I was received quite well. Um, and again, being the only uh, young black female singer that was um, kind of doing the thing made it a little bit easier because, you know, you, you had to, they had to fill certain boxes. And I say to people sometimes, like, I'll play shows and you know that you're there just because they want someone that's, like, multicultural. But... For me, I kind of look at that. I'm like, cool, that's fine. But I'm going to, I know why I'm here and I know what I'm doing. And that's allowed me to, um, just to grow and to showcase who I was. But I think it definitely came to a point where I was like, okay, there are certain things that need to be said. And I had to pull out Nilotic and really just be authentically Kenyan or just be authentically me and really, really um, not worry about what they what they would like in terms mm. of sound or in terms of words and I had to just be authentic and true to myself um and yeah I mean I think at the end of the day in terms of like words the truth always prevails they say and I think Nalotic was super um potent at that time and whether Australians like rap or not they had to listen because it was something that you couldn't try and like turn it turn it head to so um, yeah, I think it, it was received quite well, but there are still challenges. And a lot of the times you, you try and fit the box so that you can be played on the national radio and that you can hit certain awards and certain um, venues and play certain shows. But the more and more I, I think I walk in this industry, the more I realize you really just have to create what you want to create and do something that will make you happy. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's your work, it's your art, and, and you're the one that's living with it, you know, so... 
yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to navigate through it. But I think I think what I'm creating, the sound that I have found now is working for me. And people out there kind of like it. So I think we're doing <laughs> something right. <laughs> so I want us to give a spotlight to Nilotic, even though we still haven't sp- spoken about your tour from last year. Yes. Maybe because we are sp- you already were speaking about Nilotic, we can just go on, on with yeah. that and then we'll come back to the tour for and sure. touring. Um Let's get into Nilotic. Like, why did you call this uh, EP Nilotic? I mean, you are Nilotic. Yes. Uh, but I just wanted you to kind of break down the EP. There are really, really amazing songs in there. Thank you. Obviously, um, you know, like River Nile. Yeah. Pro- I love Promise. Thank you. I love Sulue. Ah! You know, it's just like you give me different vibes. And yes. I think the other thing... I want you to talk about is also producing your mm, own project. Yeah. You know, you're here talking about um there are really few women in the hip hop scene, but yeah. also there are generally very few women um in the production world yeah. and especially known. I think there must be a lot of women working in various elements of production. Yes. And I think one time I read like an um what is it like an op ed um Solange had written about mm. some, one of her previous projects and she was like I did all these things and I take so much pride in right. crediting myself and mm. my work and women just don't do that as much as they should. Right. So it's great that you produce your album, um, you. EP, that EP. So tell tell me about that. Let's go into the the, the, the title, the songs, yeah. the vibes, yeah. the frustration, oh. yeah. the inspiration. Oh. Ah, there's so <laughs> many things. Do you know the thing is funny enough, the, I think maybe even before the birth, I think um, prior to Nilotic even kind of the seed um, being laid, it was a lot of, um, it, there was a lot of things that were like laid to me subconsciously. And one moment or one day rather that I remember very, very well is I had traveled to Europe to visit my family and I was sitting with my cousin on the train. And at that time, I only had a few singles under my belt and I was still very, very fresh to the industry and I remember she proposed this artist who I had no idea about and she was just telling me about this person that had produced written arranged like did this whole album by himself and I remember as soon as as soon as she told me I was like no I don't believe it like from what I've seen like there's no way he could have done that by himself like I'm sure there should have been another producer like I just it was so unfathomable in my head so I remember just completely just disregarding it and I was like no that's not possible But I think what she did was she laid a seed that um, she didn't even know she did right. And I remember once I got back to Australia, I kind of started to really think about how that was even possible. And I think I, not that I actioned it right away, but it was just something that always sat in my head. So now flash forward to a few months later, um, COVID happens and we're all, you know, stuck at home. And at that time I was actually participating in a Zoom workout session with uh Polycup, Saudi Soul kind of group situation. <laughs> and so you are keeping yourself busy. Yeah, oh, girl. Do you know the thing is I feel like there was two routes to take during COVID. It was either you just be really lazy and you just sit and watch movies and do whatever yeah. and go, do you know what? We're supposed to break. Or you just go and go, okay, what can I learn? What can I do? What can I get my, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think I, I just couldn't sit there. I had to do something. So, um, yeah, it was really such a blessing, honestly, the way it happened. So, yeah, Polycup was running these Zoom sessions with work. And I was like, great, let me get fit. Let me, you know, be better physically. And in in those sessions, there was this one session I invited my mom to join. Ooh. Yeah. So I got my mom there doing like lunges and push-ups and that. And so <laughs> once we joined earlier... Um, my mum and Polycup were speaking. And at that time, that was their first time they were kind of like meeting virtually. So mum is speaking in Luo and she's like, oh, where are you from? All these things. And I'm kind of just sitting there like awkwardly. And it was in that conversation, I think it was Polycup that said, oh, so Elsie's a Nylot. And I remember as soon as he said that is when I kind of clocked, I was like, oh, wait, yeah, I am. Because I I don't think I had ever really fully heard that word or like understood that word. So when he said it, I was like, wow, like, yeah, I am. Like I am a Nylot. And I remember during that work workout, I was just like doing pushups and I was like, <laughs> yes, I got this. Um, and I immediately after that session, I took that to the studio. And that was the first day that I started the project <gasps> Nylotic. Whoa. Crazy, right? Yeah. 
crazy. Crazy. Right? So then, like, side note. So Polycup was really one of the main seeds that laid yeah, the whole project. Yeah, because, because you have, you know, since then you have met and worked with him yeah. on an, an album How, that is coming right? this year. How wild is that? Did you let him know this? Yes, I did. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is special. As soon as that I'm, is special. As soon as I released the first single, I think it was, I even posted on Instagram, like, that moment of my mom and Polycup speak. Because I was actually, funny enough, I was recording that session. I think I was kind of like, oh, yeah, my mom is working out. Let me pull out the camera. So I was recording that conversation. So I had it on tape and I put it on Instagram and I was like, yeah, like, Polly is the one that kind That's of so cool. birthed that seed. So, yeah, so now I translated that into, um, first, it wasn't even music. It was just research. So I sat at my computer and for many weeks, I just researched and I was like, who are the Nylots? Who are we? And of course, you stumble upon Lupita Nyong'o, um, Barack Obama, like just the big, the big giants that are out there, I mm. guess, commonly known to the world. Um, and I just dug deeper into now like tribes and kind of seeing like how we are and how, and how we act. Um, and I just found a lot of strength in that, you know, I found a lot of power. And then that's really how the project was birthed. So I did the first um, the first song, which is Nilotic, the single. And in terms of the production, girl, see, I didn't know anything to do with production, maybe apart from like the subconscious sitting behind my producer who would use Ableton and I'd kind of just like see what's going on. Mm. But I never had physically done it by myself. So it was really just experimental. Like I really just, um, I want to say I was really just a child in a way where I was experimenting, I would press buttons, I would you know, trial and see if this would work. And mind you, at this point, I had just got in that studio as well. And my friends had helped me set it up because I still didn't know what cable goes where. Like I knew wow. nothing. So it was all experimental. Um, and it was really just trying to to just see what works and what my my ears liked. And yeah, we. I remember I produced the first single and I had a session with a friend who came over to the house and I had the session up when he came into my room and he was like, wow, like you did this. And I think at this point he hadn't even heard the song. He just saw the stems and there was those things on the screen. <laughs> and he was like, wow. Well, you... Was that River Nile or, or, or this River? Was still, this was still Nilotic. Oh, okay. so this Yeah, because I remember so when I did, when I produced Nilotic, I sat with that song for so long because I think I was in such awe. Yo, you are so bad at. I yeah. I can't even believe I, it. <laughs> like you actually self-taught yourself in yeah. the, uh, the studio your friends helped you set up. Yeah. Didn't know what you're doing, I but just, produced nylotic. I'm telling you, I had no this idea. This is epic. Like my mic would, something wrong would go with my mic or like my speaker and I'd be like, there's a buzz. I would have to message them because I had no idea. So they would come in and help me and stuff. So this time he had come in saw my computer, saw these like stems. I had colored them because I knew I had to color code and I'm that freak. So he just sees it and he was like, wow, you put this together? And I was like, yeah, I did. <laughs> like I did. <laughs> but I think I was so proud of it. So when I was when I was working on that Lodic, I sat with it for so long because I was just in so much awe and disbelief that I had done that. And now that's when I flash back to my cousin on the train that was like, this guy produced and did the whole song by himself. I was like, wow, it really do be possible, you know? Um, but yeah, so after that, I I ended up getting um, my cousin to to do some ad libs and he comes on and that's what, that's what you hear the uliski awaki mm. and all those really weird calls. So cool. so I got him cool. to just come in. And again, because I didn't <laughs> know much about production, um, the, the work is very simple when you break it down. Um, you, you hear very, very minimalistic sounds that the very simple guitar line is just like me on my guitar playing mm. two notes because I don't know how to play guitar very well. So everything was really just off of the fact that I didn't know, but I had the courage to try and to attempt. And so that's how, um, yeah, that's how Nadlotic was kind of just like born and birthed and the production or the producer rather um, kind of came out of me. And I went on then to do uh, River Nile and the rest of the EP. Um, and I, 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 I think by the time we got to Promise actually, I ended up inviting my, my band players so that they could record things live. So I laid things um, on the computer, but I really wanted that jazz, raw, um, authentic kind of just like real sounds. Of I got course. my trumpet player to come in and he yeah, laid that was some cool. stuff down. It was so good, yeah. right? Yeah, and um, that's yeah. kind of the other side, you know, softer side of 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 uh, LC. Yes, very soulful. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like I think. I am so many personalities and I think that's why I always go back to Nikki because when I watch Nikki Minaj, she just has 
so many worlds to her. And I think that's who Elsie is. There's so many ways that I love to express myself. Um, and I really like to tap into that and make sure that people know that I can be, you know, pretty and soft and I can sing, you know, really well, but I can also just like, you know, drop a 16 and be really mean muggy about it and just be upfront. Um, but yeah, I think I, I've really been enjoying just exploring the different sides to me and the producer still lives in me. I think I, I try to open up now and and work with other people. Um, but I think I'm still, I'm still kind of tapping into that world and mm. making sure that I fine tune those skills. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a journey. It's really been a journey, but, um, yeah, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot. That's dope. Um, what was the experience, you know, working with Polycap on the new album that you should now tell us about? And, uh, you know, he's an amazing producer, composer, artist. Now he's singing. Yeah. So I can imagine the two of you in a studio is like a, con a cocktail of yeah. geniuses. Yeah. So what he's was the experience great. like? He's great. Do you know what? <laughs> I think aside from the music, Polly, Polly I think, figured Elsie out very quickly. He's one of the few people that just weirdly knows the things that I like and don't like and not just music, just in general. Mm. So again, it's like, yeah, after Nilotic happened, um, I immediately was like, I want to come to Kenya and, and, you know, produce an album. And he was my first point of contact. So he was like, yeah, of course, like I'm, I'm super down. And he actually helped curate the producers and writers that we worked with. And I remember once we did that, I still got to Kenya and was like, let me still try and meet people and see if maybe there are other writers or other producers. Yeah. And everyone, everyone that I met, they were great, but they definitely weren't who I was looking for at that time. So I remember like I, would, I was staying with him at this time, right? So I would leave the house, have a meeting with people and come back and I'll tell him like, oh yeah, I met with so-and-so. And he would just be like, and then how did it go? <laughs> and I would be like, yeah, that it's not, it's not what I'm looking for. So he just did a really good job at um, just seeing, seeing who I am outside of the music and within and the music. And kind of curating and the curated right team. So beautifully, so beautifully. So then we went up to Naivasha. Uh, it was myself, Polycup, a writer called Dwyer and another producer called Gordon. You are from Watenda Wheelie. Yes. Yeah. Correct. And for those who are listening, we're talking about fancy fingers because now he has kind of two um, uh, yeah. Monicas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So someone might be like, who's Polycap? So Polycap Potieno of Saudi Soul, the guitarist, fancy. composer, producer is also fancy fingers. Yes, the sir. artist. We're talking yeah. about fancy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we had, yeah. So we had fancy myself. Uaya and Gordon, who is known as Watermuller as well. Oh, yeah. You know him, right? Oh, Isn't my just God. So You're really rolling with the best. <laughs> so that's the thing. Like, I was so just grateful Just say Watermuller. That's what we know. I'm like, who's right? Gordon? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? That's the thing. I feel like once you get to know certain people, you know them in of a more course, personal way. Of so course. I think, of course. Of yeah, course. But then that's why you're even calling Polika Polika. I just call him Polly, Because right? then that's like it, that's the person. What I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But fancy. I like that. Um, but yeah, so we went up to Naivasha and we spent two weeks up there. Wow. Locked up and just created. And it was a room full of strangers. Like I, obviously I knew fancy, but not so well, right? Like I had just got into his house. I was staying with him at his place for about, I think about a month before we went on to the, to the camp, but I still obviously didn't know him so well, but, um, getting to know each still other, getting to know each other. Everyone was kind of brand new to each other, but I think that was the beauty because you don't have these standards or like made up scenarios or expectations for people. So it was really nice to go in and it was like fresh, fresh canvas. And so it was really, really special to, to create from scratch and to learn each other and to know each other from scratch. So we spent two weeks and that's where we, yeah, we created and kind of formed the debut album. Wow. Yeah. And what a 360 moment for Wild. this amazing Kenyan Australian artist to be able to create her debut album, at you know, home. from Kenya at yeah. home with these amazing creatives. And yeah. you say, we didn't necessarily know each other very well prior to oh. that. But once we met, it was a match made magic, in heaven. Magic. And that's the thing, you know, I think there are times things happen and they're really big reminders of that. Really, really you are on the right path and you are with the right people. Because I think a lot of times, especially in the industry, you could be a really great artist or a really great writer, singer, whatever it is. But if you're not surrounded by the right people, 
it amounts to nothing. And, and that's simply because a lot of the times I don't think we see it, but it's really the people that are around us that push us and give us certain opportunities or, you know, kind of just see the light that is in our eyes that we can't see for ourselves. And so, yeah, yeah it, it was really just literally a match made in heaven and it was such a blessing. So, yeah, I, I love those guys. Amazing. And, and you know, I completely relate with what you're saying because we had a conversation before we started this podcast and I was just saying, had it not been for the team mm. behind um, this podcast and Dana said us specifically, I don't know if I'd be sitting here talking to you because I literally came here to do something else um, last year and he just called me and was like, where is your podcast? Why are you not yeah, podcasting? Right. And it's something I wanted to do, but it was until... He kind of held my hand hand and said, or hands and said, you know, this is your home. You yeah. know, just come here. We're going to support you. I so sometimes that. you really need that. You need Who, that whoever someone. you are, wherever point in your life you are, sometimes you just need a little nudge. Yeah, 100%. So thank we you, Stan. And thank you, Fancy and Wodomolo yeah, and uh, Uaya. Yeah, bless And everyone bless who's hands. been kind to Elsie and, you know, treated you so well while you're in Kenya, even your family. Yeah. It's so dope. You're talking about your aunties, yeah. you know, being like your mommy. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about hanging out <laughs> with family when ah. you're in Kenya. <laughs> you know what? It's been, it's, it was actually such an interesting one coming because every time I came to Kenya, it was always for family. So that was the first time that I came solely for music. But now obviously family doesn't care. Yeah. Like come to the house, <laughs> you're gonna sleep over, you're gonna eat. So I, it was such a it was such a toss in um, between, you know, obviously having to work and going away to Naivasha or staying at Polly Cup's house for the sake of just it being quicker. But it was so special as well to still get the time to spend with my aunties and cousins. And we, you know, would go out and just go to shows, go to lunch and spend some time still. together. But yeah, I, I think with my aunties, it's such a blessing because they're all the same in, in every which way. Like I was saying, they eat the same they speak the same. They that it's just their personality. They're they're very, they're just very similar in in the way that they treat us. You know, the the grandkids and the children or whoever it is. Um, and so it's really such a seamless transition to kind of just come and dump my bags in the house and be like, I'm home. <laughs> and you kind of just know that you're going to be received with so much love. So yeah, it was such a blessing to have my aunties out here because it felt like I was just right at home. That's dope. Yeah. By the way, what are your favorite um, African or Kenyan foods? Oh, chapati and dengu is my top, like That's number nice. one. That's and that will, do you know what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. That would never change. But you know, the funny thing is I say that and people are like, Dengu? Why? Well, like, people love chapo madondo, like with the beans. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, I don't know. I'm, is that weird? No. I think I actually rather right. dengu because beans right. is too mainstream. Yeah. I, I'm just different. <laughs> but my mom makes it so well. My mom makes it so well. I feel like I've just, yeah. Because, so my mom is a chef, right? And oh. I think, yeah, she's a, sh like, that was like the first. So she makes like samosas. Oh my gosh. Nice she does fish. It all. A little woman will be making nice fish. Now I'm hungry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Me too. I've been crying. But no, she's she's just she just cooks so well. Um, and yeah, I think there's just a, there's a way that she just makes it that I'm like, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. So yeah, chapo and dengue is probably my like number one for sure. Okay. So let's not confuse our people. <laughs> <laughs> when is this album gonna drop? What should we expect? Like, it's just exciting and yeah. we can't wait to see your debut album. What What do we need to know? I think for now, all I'm gonna say is stay tuned. Mm -hmm. You gotta keep on the socials and keep in touch. But um, I'm in the next few months, I think you're gonna see a bit more. I wanna reveal slowly because honestly, in terms of the story, it was such a long time and a long journey for me so I think it only made sense for me to also introduce it of you know course. in glimpses of and, and in sections because I think every little thing has so much substance and I think I want to allow the people to take time and to really sit with the music and to really digest it so few singles coming up soon and the album will be just around the corner. Amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Before we get into other plans for 2024, do you want to tell us about your tour in 2023? Ah, you had yes. a successful European tour. I was yes. actually in Europe and I was hoping I would catch you, but you were too fast to we, be caught. <laughs> <laughs> we just you literally were in Prague. You're 
Right? Yeah, we did. Yes. But your dates were the same? No, after. So oh. I was trying to see where... But you're just too fast. Do you you're know, too fast for me, girl. That kind of sucks, though, because I remember even with Fancy, he was also touring at the same time. And the amount of times I was like, I'm in Amsterdam, where are you? And he was like, no, I'm flying into Amsterdam tomorrow. But I'm like, no, I'm flying to Berlin. The next. Like, it was just such a miss. But we're going to go to Europe together. But um, yeah, Europe was good. I will say, like, if it's anything... I thank God for Hilltop Hoods. So Hilltop Hoods are the the goats of yeah. um, Australia. They're one of the, you know, first bands that kind of put hip hop on the map. And, and was, how, how did you even get that chance? Let like, me tell you. you are so legit. You know, That's a biggie. God works. You know, God really works. I think it, it, it's, it comes, um, I think it just comes from, first of all, just good people. Because Hilltop, those boys are just real, real sweet. And the beauty was that we were coming from the same city. And nice. Adelaide is the very small, like, town that no one wants to go to. And we're the, we're the one that everyone hates. But it was so... It, it, every, we're boring, <laughs> Why? apparently. Why? Because you're a small town. Yeah. And it's like, what do they have to offer? Exactly. See what they're offering now. <laughs> Talk to me now. Talk to me now. But that's the thing. Because Adelaide is, like, the small... It's like, I say it's the shugs of Australia. Because no one ever... Like, people come there to retire, basically. So... I think it was such a beautiful thing that, yeah, Hilltop was from that city. Obviously, I was from there. And at that time, I was, um, yeah, I had just released Nilotic. So even before the Europe tour, I did the Australian arena tour with them, which was, again, like the most insane thing because it's something that we had spoken about with a few people a few years back. So for that to happen was amazing. And I remember after that, I was like, wow, like they were so good to me. And I'm like, I've 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 done my time with them and that's it. But then for them to call me up again for the European oh, wow. and UK tour for they me, I was like, you. yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, you guys. Um, but it was such a blessing because we had already obviously built that um, rapport, relationship. Relationship, and that rapport. exactly. So beautiful. Coming out to Europe was like it was easy in terms of even just getting there and kind of doing the tour because I knew the boys and they were my brothers and I knew it was going to be simple and they were so lovely. But yeah, I they kind of granted me my first ever shows in Europe and UK. That's dope, that's dope. To crowds that were insane. You know, it's, it's something that you could only really dream of, especially as still a, a, an upcoming artist. But I'm really just so grateful to them because they see something in me um, that not many people do. So they were they were really sweet to, um, yeah, kind of just grant me that and, and bring me up on their tour and mm. ex you know, expose me to that to that market on that side. So yeah, the tour was amazing. I got to, I got to also just like, go to places that I had never been to. So it was really nice to also kind of be a tourist and and just have fun. And I went with a DJ out there. Her name was Jess. So we we also just took our time to like kick our feet up a little bit and That's enjoy nice. the sun on that side. So yeah, it was really, really good. That's nice. Yeah. One of your songs was actually acquired by a game and we were talking about this. I never understand yes. this thing. So educate me <laughs> and us, please. This is now... this is a big deal also. <laughs> it is. No, do you know what? This is now where I go, I thank God for my brothers because I know a little bit Bit, a little bit about soccer and that kind of world but yeah so we synced River Nile to eFootball mm. which is huge um and I think I didn't even understand the magnitude until we released because obviously that stuff comes with prior kind of um conversations and once it came out it was a reception that I was not expecting especially from Kenya because I no, to like all the comments, all the messages, it was just Kenyans like, oh my gosh, I heard Swahili on eFootball. Amazing. And I felt so good. Like, and and honestly, for me, I think it kind of shifted from even like the song being on there, but to just being like, wow, like I'm representing my people, like I'm representing the country. And it it really um it really kind of showed me that I am tied to these people. And as much as I feel like I'm so far from them. They really pulled me in close. So yeah, it was really, really cool to just see that reception and get so, so much love from from the Kenyan community. So yeah, we we on eFootball now, baby. <laughs> yeah, I think it's those kind of moments that you you know something happens and you look back and you're like, oh my god, everything now makes sense. Yeah. The struggle um, it took for me to get here. Every time I doubted myself, mm. and then see where um and see all the people proud of my work mm. not that you thought that was going to be the 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 re response but yeah. then when you find that that's the response i think it's always something that is kind of um lifting mm. you up and makes you want to do even more even stuff more. exactly yeah so that's dope and congratulations yeah. thank you thank you <laughs> as we wrap up i just wanted to kind of try and retrace 
um, the history of popular women mm -hmm. in music yeah. that have inspired you. So if you think of um, Australian women, um, it doesn't have to be specific to hip hop and even Kenyan. Mm. Who are some of the women um, or your earlier influences who you feel uh, more important yeah. in kind of defining yourself or just inspiring you to become who you are? Yes. No, there was a few actually. I think the first three that pop up to my head um, starting in Australia would be uh, TK Maidza. So she, funny enough, was the artist that I kind of, I feel like I kind of sat in her slot once she went off to become TK Miser. So she also comes from Adelaide. And at that time when she was recording, I think it was her uh, single from the EP that kind of, you know, took off. I was in the studio with her and I would watch and the producer that was there was now the producer that I started to work with. So I remember when she took off, I physically sat in the seat that she used to sit in. So I remember I started using her almost as a blueprint and just to go, okay, like how did she do this and how did she kind of maneuver? Um, so she was definitely someone that I was looking up to and kind of just watching and I still do till this day. And then now fast, like fast forward to around like Nilotic times, Sampa the Great was the second girl that, oh, she is, she is just a down, like she is, I don't even know the words, but for her, I think, she played a really big part in in my life and in my career, just in this in the side of understanding the power that we have as as Africans. Because again, at that time, that was the whole like Black Lives Matter movement time. And so when she released, uh, I think it was Final Form, which was the first um, the return rather the first album. She also went back to Zambia and you know recorded over there and it was just so beautiful to see her putting Zambia and Africa on the forefront and it do so well because you're taught that that stuff doesn't work right and so it was so beautiful to just see a woman of color rapping and putting herself and her culture at the forefront and being so confident in it to the point that if you didn't like it, you were the problem. <laughs> like, if someone came and, and, and said, I see how you pick up some of those oh, mannerisms. Yeah, I love yeah. it. I do you know. I think it's one of those things where there are things that are so in, it's undeniable. Like if you're going against it, like you really are the crazy one, you know. <laughs> so yeah, Sampa really um, played a really big role. And I remember we I played a festival. Um, Groove in the Moo, and that's where I first met her. And that was even prior to her album. But I remember even just meeting her, she, um, I remember we took a photo, she wrapped me, she was wearing this really big um, robe cloak kind of garment and she wrapped me in it. And in that moment, I like, I just felt like, wow, like I'm seen. And it was cool to also see someone that looks like me doing what I wanted to do. So she, yeah, she really did play a really big part and she still does to this day. Um, and now coming to Kenya, I think the biggest the biggest person I would say that played a role was Mudoni because she was the first, um, I guess, rapper uh, that I fell on across when it came to Kenyan artists. And for, I actually learned about her in Australia because she played a festival called Womb Adelaide. And so I learned um, about her from a, I think it was like the director of that festival. Um, and my cousin also used to play her all the time and I never just realized. So yeah, she was she was definitely um, one of the Kenyan female artists that I stumbled across that I started to like pick up on and learn. I was like, okay, cool. How is she doing it? How can I jump on this? And how can I come and, you know, translate that across into my world? So yeah, those are definitely the three that played a part in my career. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. So in summary, what would you like to tell anybody who's listening? Ooh. You know, fans of Elsie, new mm -hmm. listeners. Um, yeah, any message that you want to share with oh, them? There's a lot. Do you know, do you know <laughs> we could sit here for another hour? We really you could. don't even ask her up yeah. this. She's like, I could start. I, I have some buzz. <laughs> <laughs> just starts like spinning. No, I feel like, um, I think, I mean, if it's in terms of Elsie, I think it's, um, yeah, just keep a look at, uh, I, first of all, actually, I appreciate the love. I appreciate the support. Um, and I really, really do thank the Australian, the Kenyan community, anyone out there that's listening, thank you so much for listening. Um, and if it's anything, I'm really excited to share this album and to really, yeah, show off this next phase of who Elsie is. Because I think after Nalotic, especially, people really were like, okay, cool. 
this is LC. We've we've now seen a glimpse of who she is. But I'm really excited to just like screw and reverse back and <laughs> give a whole different, you know, personality that no one I'm sure ever saw coming. Um, so if it's anything, I think I just want to say thank you for listening. But please continue to tune in because, yeah, we've got really, really good stuff that are coming up. Um, and yeah, I'm going I'm to I'm keep doing I'm going to keep doing me. I'm going to just keep doing me. Asante Sana, LC. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in to VIP Access. I promised you great artists, VIP celebrities, multi-talented individuals. Elsie Wameo is a Kenyan-Australian artist, musician, producer, an all-round cool individual. Please follow her on all her social media platforms. And her album will be coming out this year, so we have to support, we have to share. Remember, VIP Access is coming to you every Tuesdays. We got new episodes. Please keep supporting Dope African content, dope Kenyan content. Let's just keep building and exchanging culture. Thank you so much. It's been amazing to have you all here at VAP Access. We'll be back next week with another amazing artist. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank Ciao. you so much. And keep supporting in Nico. Yes. Thank you so much for having me as well. Yeah. Karibu, karibu sana. VIP Access Season 4 is proudly supported by the Australian High Commission.